arrest involved an offender who made a series of mistakes that made it possible for him to be identified. My concern allegedly with the use of existing law enforcement tools, we're not kidding the truly sophisticated, the most high-risk organized criminal offenders. Through our task force, one of the things that we're doing is exploring new techniques, including clustering Bitcoin transactions to identify patterns. And we hope to learn from the techniques that were utilized by law enforcement to penetrate freedom hosting. For the future, the pace of innovation will quicken, there will be new technologies, and the intensity of the effort to achieve total internet anonymity will increase. You ask, what can Congress do? I think there are four things. First, you can ensure that existing law and regulation focusing on the point at which virtual currencies are being exchanged for conventional currencies are used. Secondly, you can press for global cooperation. Digital economy funds flow globally, network to network, not nation to nation. This is a problem that the U.S. government cannot solve alone. Thirdly, you can ensure that the response of government to this fragile, emerging, high-risk, but high-reward area is not so draconian that the effect is simply to push these new enterprises out of the United States into countries where there's little or no regulation. And finally, you can help us address the core challenge, Internet anonymity. For all of its importance in protecting political dissidents, journalists, and others, we are very concerned. Oop. We are very much rebuffering. Uh-oh. Rebuffering. Are we broadcasting now? We are live. Uh, no one's probably watching, but I'm also not sure on the sound. Can you hear the hearing? I can. They make a mistake. Three years ago, the then Secretary of State, Hibbert Hillary Clinton, in her remarks on a free internet, said, on the one hand, anonymity protects exploitation of children. On the other hand, anonymity protects the free expression of opposition to repressive governments. She added, we should err on the side of openness while recognizing there are going to be exceptions. That's the challenge, Mr. Chairman, is to determine how anonymous the Internet can be from the perspective of government and law enforcement around the world. We feel that absolute Internet anonymity is a prescription for catastrophe. Thank you, Ms. Rowland. Very good testimony. Mr. Mark, welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman Carper. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Patrick Merck. I'm general counsel for the Bitcoin Foundation. I'm a founding member of the Bitcoin Foundation, and I have been an executive in legal and business development for a number of digital currency companies. I'm skeptical of him because he's a lawyer. Foundation, a fledgling charitable organization for the Bitcoin I've quoted him several times. The Bitcoin Foundation is a member-driven nonprofit representing a global constituency of business and individuals contributing to the overall Bitcoin ecosystem. Our membership is comprised of many of the top companies, entrepreneurs, and technologists working to make Bitcoin a success. The Foundation's mission is to promote, protect, and standardize the use of distributed, decentralized currencies and to free people to transact on their own terms in the global economy. Having said that, there is no Bitcoin company that manages or controls the software or its operation. The software is built and maintained by a community of volunteer open source software engineers and a distributed network of transaction processing, often referred to as mining. At its most basic level, Bitcoin is an internet protocol, L for money. The Bitcoin protocol operates a decentralized store of value and an open and transparent payment network that is secure, efficient, and low cost. The Bitcoin network can operate without any third-party intermediaries and is a highly innovative global financial system unto itself. In the near future, the Bitcoin protocol will also facilitate advanced payment services, and experiments are currently underway to provide additional non-financial services like property management and identity verification. Open and participatory systems like Bitcoin will produce many economic and social benefits. 
These systems can reduce exploitation of vulnerable populations the world over and here in the US by providing a safe and private store of wealth in addition to a global transaction network that cannot be corrupted or abused by those who would seek to exploit or harm others. Financial exclusion is a U.S. problem. It is not just a problem for the global south. There is a rising tide of unbanked and underbanked borders. This is important because access to financial services directly correlates to increased dignity, liberty, and self-determination. Bitcoin can help move people trapped in a cash-based informal economy into a globally connected digital economy. Woohoo! At the same time, we acknowledge that, like any technology, there is a potential for abuse of this system. Bitcoin can be used for illicit purposes, and the law enforcement community may help new methodologies for interdicting and investigating criminal activity on the network. This does not mean that it will be any harder to prevent the misuse of the Bitcoin network than existing financial systems. Yes. As we heard in earlier testimony, in Bitcoin's short history, Law enforcement and regulatory agencies have had a string of notable successes already. Rather than belabor the overwrought headlines about misuse of Bitcoin and the digital economy, we should be congratulating the law enforcement community on their hard work and skill and adapting investigative techniques to an increasingly digital and openly networked world. Keeping the Bitcoin network safe is all of our responsibility, and industry-led efforts are underway to help prevent abuse. Like you, Mr. Chairman, we are looking beyond the Silk Road. When the alleged operator of that black market website was arrested, the markets expressed relief and optimism with a long and sustained rally in the price of Bitcoin. Decentralized currencies like Bitcoin have... It was already rallying anyway. ...currency systems. Central the rally also might be due to Bitcoin China. Yeah, I think it's presumptuous to attribute the rise in Bitcoin to the capture of Dread Pirate Roberts. They said the same thing after the they claimed that the market crashed after 9/11 and it didn't oh, actually. Oh, you got the bad guy away. That's why it's doing so future. well. Future. Need to consider. We should be congratulating people. law enforcement. He says this guy talks it like a lawyer. Out, the blockchain, <laughs> which is Bitcoin's public ledger system, may be so revealing that the larger problem with Bitcoin is not anonymity for criminals, but the difficulty law-abiding people have maintaining their own privacy. Bitcoin is not some magical cloaking device that simply allows criminals free reign. That's a Star Trek reference there. ...or unsolvable threat to law enforcement and regulatory community. The use of Bitcoin is not unregulated. In fact, Bitcoin service providers operate in heavily regulated business environments with deeply entrenched competitors. For these potential competitors, be they banks, payment networks, financial service companies, Bitcoin also is an opportunity for them to start innovating again. These institutions already have a deep understanding of the controls and risk management necessary to safely handle Bitcoin transactions and consumer Bitcoin accounts. Instead, what we've seen is a chilling effect through the banking industry as Bitcoin companies try and gain bank accounts. The United States has a strong interest in maintaining its place as a global leader in developing cutting-edge technology and spreading individual freedom and liberty around the world. <laughs> Where does this guy live? Driver right. Job creation and economic growth. Just, I'm just trying to figure out whether or not he's blowing smoke up their booty. Business and or he's also is the best measure we can take to keep good actors in the system. He's got to be on his best behavior. He's before Congress. Regulations that encourage right, so experimentation is critical to a vibrant entrepreneurial community. This committee's work is undeniably helpful. Like Dan Tanashku from um, Lucy, you know, he talks about things being regulated and blah, 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 but he's a full-on anarchist and does not believe in government uh, uh, regulation whatsoever, but he does talk about that in his big uh, conferences as well. Does. Having said that, we are encouraged by... Big her. red candle on Mt. Gox pushing Bitcoin below 700 suddenly bought up. Oh. ...respectful dialogue between Ooh. key stakeholders will help ensure that the substantial benefits of the digital economy are met while mitigating many of the risks. In particular, we would like to thank FinCEN for opening up a dialogue with the Bitcoin community and for demonstrating leadership on this issue... I think I might close out my Bitcoin and... 
Buy back in at 200. Hold! And dialogue, and thanks to the committee for allowing us to participate in this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Uh, Mr. Allaire? Chairman Carper, thank you for hearing my testimony this afternoon. My name is Jeremy Allaire, and I'm the founder and CEO of Circle Internet Financial, a recently launched financial services company aimed at facilitating payments and money transfers using global digital currency, Bitcoin. I've been building internet software platforms and online services companies for two years, having founded and helped to lead multiple global companies with products used by hundreds of millions of consumers and hundreds of thousands of businesses globally. I'm here to testify because I believe that digital currency represents one of the most important technical and economic innovations of our time. Yay! Digital currency introduces advancements in electronic payments and money transfers, potentially materially... Ah, uh, messed it up. Oh man, he was going great. I thought he was going to be bashing Bitcoin because he has something to lose, but it seems like he sees that he has something to gain in Bitcoin. World decreasing fraud risk for consumers and merchants, increasing consumer privacy, and expanding the market for consumer financial products on a worldwide basis. Yes. This technology moves from early adopters into mainstream acceptance. It is critical that federal and state governments understand how Bitcoin fits into existing regulatory guidelines and how to apply them to digital currency. These should uphold consumer protections associated with fraud and privacy risks, Ensure that criminals and bad actors find it increasingly difficult to utilize these platforms. No more bad actors. Clarity to consumers and businesses that conduct <laughs> using digital currency. It's very clear that over the past 20 years, the internet has been at the center of global economic innovation. Open platforms have transformed communications, media, where education, commerce, and retail. But for a variety of reasons, the technology and business models around finance has been insulated from similar... Well, for some reason, we just can't imagine what that reason could be, not like government's in charge of it or anything. Perhaps because of the shutdown of e-gold and Liberty Reserve, digital currencies weren't properly expanded. ...that we've seen brought to bear on other industries. I don't think there's much we can't even have the conversation as to why we're still using fossil fuels to uh, matter, you know, to fuel our vehicles, you know, and that <laughs> systems and processes that predate the internet. People don't even want to acknowledge diesel, you know. There are for business and less efficient economic interaction, and in many cases, our financial systems have excluded enormous bases of consumers who remain unbanked or underbanked. The combination of ubiquitous internet connections and digital underfed, undereducated, underserved, underbanked. That is the weirdest change to the English language recently. It's bizarre. Communicate. What, is, what do you think he means by underbanked? Video uh, format uh, at no cost. It, it hasn't been made easy enough for uh, enough people effectively to effectively cost. You they have access. Media like they're underfed. They're not fed enough. They're yeah. undernourished. You're not nourished enough. Exactly. Underbanked. You're not banked enough. People well, don't want to have a savings account where there's a ne negative savings rate. They don't want to keep their money in there when there's the threat that it can be confiscated. And um, yeah. Well, unbanked, I understand, because that's like a that's like an actual measurement. Unbanked, I mean, you don't have a bank account. Underbanked implies that there is some ideal amount of banking that you should be doing, and you're just not doing enough. Right. It's well, a value it's judgment. About, it's not a measurement. I think they talk about underbanked communities, so it's easier. You can't talk about an underbanked person, but if you know, you would expect like ninety percent of a community to have a bank account. And only fifty percent does. I guess they would be an underbanked community. Much like people who are underserved, um, or under control, medical, or people that are low income and high risk, and um, U.S. state financial authorities. We're developing our platforms to provide. Like very high the community levels. that I live in right now in uh, Northeast Philadelphia, I would say, is underbanked, and a lot of the people, whenever they receive a paycheck of any kind or or check of any kind. They have to go to a check cashing place. They get pieces of their money stolen from them everywhere they go because they don't have yeah. a bank. Well, as has been made amply clear, but they're not Americans, and so they shouldn't be able to get, you know, those kinds of protections. Derek, come on now. 
cryptocurrencies to finance ah. criminal activities, including terrorism. But in addition to FinCEN's guidance and the appropriate requirement that Bitcoin operators Secrecy Act provisions... Next, they need to go back to Mexico. ...doesn't support yeah. innovative companies gaining access to U.S. banking... Taking all our jobs. ...companies offshore and overseas. <laughs> Another risk... That is this guy still talking? I mean, what, what does he really have to say? From the IRS I believe they gave him seven minutes and he's going to take it all. He's, he's just talking like... About the, he's talking about the IRS there right now. Invaders. Without clear guidance on consumer protection... Can you turn him up, Thomas? Yep. Consumers and businesses could be defrauded through inadequate systems and risk management procedures around customer funds. I believe Google Plus does a, a suppressing of your volume uh, whenever anyone else speaks, so it's my understanding that the volume it does not need to be adjusted. American companies from I'll give it a shot. Driving cool. Innovation. Indeed, today, a Bitcoin exchange in China has become the largest single trading exchange in the world. Woo! It's in Japan and Europe. We need to uphold and support our incredible history in America of supporting technical innovation and entrepreneurship. In terms of U.S. regulation, it appears to me that federal and state regulators seem to have ample statu statutory authority to adopt regulations and take enforcement actions as necessary to protect consumers and ensure responsible conduct in the world of Bitcoin. So Con there are two out of the seven, two people are pro-Bitcoin. We stand ready to assist them in their ongoing efforts to adapt. Who were like not pro and not against. And I believe the remaining three, I suppose, are very internet-led transformation, this time in our global financial systems, and there's a real opportunity to foster that economic change while simultaneously putting in place the safeguards that only government can enable. Ooh. And that concludes my prepared testimony. Safeguards that only government... Thank you, sir. That was, that was a very, very helpful testimony. Thanks. Enable. Guido, please, uh, please proceed. Welcome. We're delighted that you're here. Mr. Chairman, thank you for having me here today. Uh, we're here today to discuss uh, virtual currencies in general, uh, but it is Bitcoin in particular that has so many interested uh, in this topic. But online virtual currencies are nothing new for decades, from uh, World of Warcraft Gold. Can we move forward from all the historical uh, examples and get to the damn point? PayPal, Visa, Western Yeah, well, there, uh, this is the first time I've heard about them uh, mention World of Warcraft and virtual currencies that are like, on a gaming platform. That's kind of yeah. It is remarkable technical. Well, but I want to know who's first. Neo, because I want to be Trinity. And it's a decentralized part of that sentence uh, that is really unique. We had Star Trek. <laughs> We're just going to have all the... Uh... Well, why... So Terminator. it's like they all had prepared statements. So oh, no. this guy, he's just doing the. They're all going to do the background of Bitcoin, like, oh well, virtual currencies actually aren't new. Ensuring that transactions between its customers are reconciled. However, by solving a long-standing conundrum in computer science known as the double spending problem. It's so funny they don't have anyone from any Bitcoin business there, do they? They have the Bitcoin Foundation there. Oh, I didn't see that. Who's have we seen that person? Yeah, it was um, lawyer. In the yeah, we have. He's a lawyer. I, I've never heard of him. I don't it was a know. lawyer, Patrick Merck, and this guy, oh. uh, Jerry oh. Burrito. I've quoted him several times before. So, especially benefit small businesses from the Mercatus Center. What do we know about them? Run by a single company. It used to be a foreign policy type institute. Hold on a second. Can you make that picture bigger of that man, please? It's talking right now. Law enforcement has long relied on financial intermediaries to help them detect, prevent, and investigate illegal transactions. Because Bitcoin's uh, transactions... He looks like a man from the New York City Bitcoin group. ...transactions are not necessarily tied to identities, it is not surprising that we have seen Bitcoin employed in criminal transactions. But it's not him. Bitcoin has been used in drugs and in malware that holds one state hostage. It's also not difficult to imagine how the technology could be employed in money laundering. Emerging technologies often present both great potential benefits as well as real risks. For example, 3D printing can be used to cheaply make prostheses and life-saving devices, but also undetectable firearms. Oh, uh, undetectable firearms are bad. Shipping, but could also be used for stalking. 
policymakers is to address the risk. He may just be coaching his like like sort of buffering his testimony because he said something really interesting a second ago. He said because Bitcoin is not proprietary, no one needs permission to innovate in the Bitcoin sphere. And that's um that's not something most statists will say. <laughs> not require communities, one must still acquire bitcoins by exchanging dollars. And merchants that accept bitcoins will very often use Bitcoin payment processors. Indeed, there's a fast-growing ecosystem of startup exchanges, payment processors, and wallet and escrow services that make up Bitcoin's burgeoning infrastructure. Each of these are already subject to regulation as money transmitters, including state licensing and fence and registration, as well as know your customer and suspicious activity report requirements. More to the point, serious criminals looking to hide their tracks are more likely to choose a centralized virtual currency run by an intermediary willing to lie to regulators for a fee. Rather than... <laughs> what does that sound like? ...must make a record of every transaction, even if pseudonymously. While the online black market Silk Road, which used bitcoins, is estimated to have generated less than $200 million in drug sales, the centralized digital currency Liberty Reserve is believed to have laundered more than $6 billion related to credit card fraud, identity theft, computer hacking, and child pornography. Yeah, and think about all the crimes that have been committed with U.S. dollars. The system of yeah. the criminals online is that it was designed and... The drug deal was completed using cash. ...and reporting and to evade subpoena. Aided by the U.S. military at the behest of the commander-in-chief Bitcoin's beneficial potential as a result of network and its deals made with Henry Kissinger developed by making sure that entrepreneurial innovators yeah. can easily comply with... Well, he must be sweating. He's uh, revealing a little too much truth in his statement. ...or otherwise making it more costly to operate legitimately in this space could have two unintended consequences. First, it might mean ceding the network to exclusively illegal use and foregoing any visibility that law enforcement could otherwise gain into the activities of compliant firms. And second, the United States could lose its heads in what may be the next break to break breakthrough industry if it establishes a regulatory regime that hampers Bitcoin while other countries like China and Canada and Germany That's a good warning. ...workable regulations for Bitcoin. You know what he just said? He said you put up too much, reg too many regulations, and America will be behind the ball when foreign countries adopt Bitcoin. Yeah. Exactly. But instead, it's an open source project and a community. The Bitcoin Foundation is central to that community, but it does not encompass the whole community. So, as new guidelines and procedures are developed, policy. So I'm so glad that he's saying this, but really, what is it? What difference is it going to make with this bumbling? Democrat from Delaware uh, goes home and, and says, oh, okay, well, they told me, you know, we need to not regulate Bitcoin because uh, other countries are going to take a bit, are, are going to uh, innovate ahead of us. I mean, is anyone really going to listen to this guy, Tom Carper? Is he furious? Uh, we were discussing an issue like this around which there's not a great deal of uh, consensus is to use these. So the not price, the price, so. Yeah, the price. And I thought we made a little progress with the uh, the first panel, and uh, I'm hopeful we can do that, uh, replicate that. In, uh, <laughs> okay. And, um, yeah, tune in and let's talk so to that, uh, toward that goal. Let me let me just ask you to reflect on what you've heard from your colleagues on uh, on this panel. Rob and Messel you, says to say hello. And hello. Staff members that are here, uh, whoever's watching on on television here in the Capitol or at Capitol, or on the uh, internet, you know, it's like television. television. Among the four, the, uh, the perspectives you shared with us, the opinions that you shared with us, where do you think there's general agreement? Second question, where do you think there's not agreement? And go about reconciling that lack of agreement. If we, if we I can. didn't understand those questions. Where, his question is where do you think there's uh, Carver, agreement, I think there where is there where not agreement. agreement about the potential of a digital economy and virtual currencies? Uh, I think there is absolute agreement that there is enormous potential for social good uh, and that this is an emerging technology uh, that needs... That's refreshing to hear. Uh, I also think there is clear agreement uh, that we can't just ignore the misuse 
uh, and that the misuse Why not? of a digital it's None of your business. Don't get involved. The viability. We must stop issues, cash. You know, cash is causing time. problems. Um, so I, I don't think there is. It's literally that ridiculous, uh, Thomas. As it relates to areas, they um, wouldn't call in the uh, CEO of the Center for Missing and Exploited Children for basic or Chinese yuan because those are being traded for children. The application. Well, I'm, I'm sure a lot of kidnappers are paid in cash. He has the same arguments against uh, cash. Uh, know your customer. You know those. That's true. Are, that's a good point. Um, that is a good point. The, the if there was no cash in the United States, there'd be no kidnapping of children, right? Is how do we enforce? You know, I would be perfectly fine with uh, federal regulators prohibiting the dollar. <laughs> uh, and the fact that this truly is a global phenomenon. Uh, this is something. Thank you. Uh, the the FinCEN guidance uh, on this was just issued in March of this year. Uh, the FATF guidance that Director Jasky talked about, uh, the Financial Action Task Force. I wish someone could some, do some, a. Some, some summer. I mean, I, I just am not technologically so able to do a spreadsheet corresponding with the amount of money that this money investigation is costing so the taxpayers the from here versus here. in For correlation to. Knowledge and um, about is, is really the issue that what the upside that. potential is. You know what? It, there's there's no guarantee of a gain for them. It's only a loss here. There's no way for them to win. If they save one life, Michelle, it's worth it. Uh oh. Come on, man. Do we know anyone that does like auto tune the news videos? Because I imagine there's some great dialogue in this screen. Oh yeah, you know, an like auto tune video. Yeah, that would be really cool. Uh, an auto tune video. Of me. I met that guy at a concert, and I acted like a fan and a nerdy fanboy and just worshipped him. So that as those disagreements do crop up, and they likely will, uh, we can address them quickly uh, and in a safe and sane way. Um, as to where Insane. we have to I think what I heard uh, from the other panelists. After we're done discussing this in a safe and sane way, we're going to reform drugs as well. <laughs> I, I'm this, this Patrick Merck guy, you say you've quoted him, Thomas. I, I don't know where he's coming from. He's a co-founder of the Bitcoin Foundation. He's a lawyer. Which is, makes he's their high. lawyer. He's the Bitcoin Foundation's lawyer. All right, all right. I'm not anti-lawyer. It's just like, hey, it gets my... Um, I am. Why aren't you anti-lawyer? It gets my porcupine prickly quills going. That's terrible. ...banking system. There is currently a chill in the banking system and in the banking industry that is preventing businesses from getting just simple, uh, even simple checking accounts. Yeah. Stories that if you have the word Bitcoin anywhere in your name or your documentations, you will immediately be uh, your application will be immediately placed in this the circular file as it will. Uh, so I, I think blacklists are common some, throughout United uh, States history. Uh, leadership, uh, awesome. In the industry to make sure that these companies are into the traditional system where some of the protection. It'll be easier for me to know who I want to hang with. Listed activity can be detected and rooted out. Good, thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, All the cool people are on the list. I'd like to echo some of the other past comments. Clearly, there's consensus here around the innovation that we see, the potential for uh, financial inclusion. Uh, I think there's consensus that many regulatory frameworks and tools are sufficient and being applied appropriately. Uh, I think there's consensus that the open nature of, these, of this technology, its development, its use, uh, and its oversight is a very positive framework. Yeah. There is some <laughs> tension around the question of the balance between anonymity uh, and privacy uh, and whether there are new laws that are required uh, no. to uh, end the possibility of anonymity on the Internet or to uh, uh, address that in some way. Freedom. Uh, and, you know, as I stated uh, in my comments, um, we are very focused within our business uh, on having very deep levels of identity verification, and so we view that as critical. But others within the digital currency world, uh, particularly within geographies uh, that don't have the same kinds of regulatory regimes, may not. Uh, and are there other things that we need to be thinking about, other tools that we need to be thinking about for law enforcement 
that can address some of those issues. So I think that uh, that arena needs additional and careful consideration. All right, thank you. Ms. Rita? So I think uh, there certainly is broad consensus among the panel up here, and I was very heartened to uh, to hear the first panel's message, and I think we have a lot of consensus. I'll pick two issues uh, just to give you an answer. Um, at first, where is there agreement? I was uh, very This guy looks like Clark Kent. The gentleman from the Secret Service who said that, in fact, it is centralized currencies that pose the greatest risk uh, as far as uh, money laundering and other... Uh, yes! Um, yes! Uh, yes! Um, uh, because of their nature, we're not uh, a great... I'll great have nature. what she's having. Um, <laughs> um, Ms. Uh, Shasky uh, sort of um, uh, took issue with the idea that uh, U.S. businesses might move overseas seeking a better regulatory environment. And, Did you hear um, him? He just said that, that it is um, actual it's, it's lax regulatory treatment dollars that are going to be used shopping. for those heinous and crimes. The danger is not that um, uh, somebody who's trying to facilitate an illicit business is going to leave the U.S. The danger is, is that uh, real hardworking entrepreneurs who are looking to comply just don't find a, a regulatory environment that is amenable here. Um, Brand uh, it, That's something that we don't want to allow us to stretch for too much of the time. Well, it, thank goodness at least this panel can Goodbye. see straight. Uh, uh, Mr. Allen, I think... Uh, I, good, hard-working entrepreneurs who are looking to comply are going to well, leave the country. <laughs> Aren't they looking no, no, no. not to comply? No, 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 but he makes a point about a compliance with any of the, the regulations. If an entrepreneur wants to get into a new business, they have to consider compliance. Yeah, okay. And I mean, like, look at me, Doggy. Even if I wanted to comply right now, it would cost me, like, I can't go get a, just a job and give my social security number. For me to do that, I would, I would, I would go to jail. <laughs> I would have to fill out all those forms. So even if I want to say from here, starting now, I want to go by your rules. I want to do whatever. There's so much behind that um, makes compliance completely not cost beneficial at all on any level. And so for people that have been outside the system or are trying to get a foot in the door, small business owners trying to get in, it's, um, and has applied for money transmitter licenses in a couple. Oh, 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 are they going to no, start to get up bit licenses? We'll just offer the first response. Is sure. this about bit licenses? I think um, a business yes. is going to handle consumer funds, store and uh, and and manage those, uh, interact with the banking system should be comply with the rules that have been set forth through the Bank C2 protect consumers and ensure that bad like acts Coinbase. Operate. So I think Sam. in general we very much... How are the consumers protected with three cents of every dollar that is collected from income taxes in this country goes to nine different banks from the perspective, maybe different than other prior the car, cases, and the, uh, um, the bank got back in 2008. Three cents of every dollar. How are consumers uh, being protected right now? They're not. This is to be able to build a financial services business and operate that without a sufficient investment to protect consumers and society. And so I do believe that the bar needs to be higher for financial services businesses in the United States. Yeah, the bar's really not high enough for regulations of financial businesses uh, in the US. I'd like to see regulation which doesn't require that level of compliance. I don't think that's realistic. Uh, when I founded the company and sought capital uh, to build this company, we understood that the bar was higher and we raised sufficient capital to be able to uh, launch our product and service in a compliant manner and hire the professionals and staff and put in place the systems. We complied so everyone else should. We jumped uh, through the hula hoops challenges. so everyone else should. Now we love the hula hoops that were so difficult for us. The states, the divergent no, but I do appreciate the point he's making uh, because, you know, he's not someone, Derek, who's living his life outside the system as an anarchist and blah, blah, blah. So he's working within the system, fine. So... Thanks. I think what he's saying is there are already sufficient laws in place. There don't, there doesn't need to be any additional ones targeted for, uh, for online currency. It so, sounded a little Stockholm syndrome esque to me in that he was saying like, oh, all of these uh, barriers to entry are great. 
to those. Uh, I, I've been, I've been, I was bit by a rabid dog, so you should and too. And I think it is an appropriate use of, of, the, of, the, of the law, existing law, and I think it's a reasonable approach. I agree with him that one of the great challenges is creating consistency and uniformity because of our federal system and the fact that there could be different approaches. It's not but, challenging to have uniformity. Hands off. Thank you. Mr. Mark, any, any thoughts, please? Yeah, uh, the the, the uh, fifty state money transmitter license regime has come up. Um, license regime. They have a a an interest in protecting their consumers. Um, at the same time, it is a bit burdensome and it has slowed down progress in the U.S. I don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, I know in the EU they have a system of reciprocity where they have a minimum threshold for each country and if you attain a license in one country you can passport it to other countries as well. Perhaps that's a global thing. Bitcoin licenses. But that would be best left to 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 the Is list. that what's suggested by the Bitcoin Foundation lawyer? Um, yes. Well, he just said, you know, Europe is uh, they're a pioneer in the realm of interstate licensing. So. Yeah, global governance. So he wasn't suggesting it. He was he was uh, articulating it. It was an option. And a requirement to register with FinCEN if you are acquiring, say, Bitcoin in order to um, buy goods or services. But let's say, for example, that um, you know, my mother's from Spain, and recently I helped her send money. Um, is it possible to see the video bigger? The total amount. What if I was buying Bitcoin See what, Derek, to admit money overseas as you know, could be one of the great potential uh, benefits uh, to allow uh, uh, remittances to the third world? Right there. Countries. Um, that is not covered by the FinCEN guidance. Uh, so I think the guidance could use further um, explanation, and uh, I think if FinCEN were to put any further clarification up to public comment, uh, they would, uh, I think, get um, uh, all this out. Okay, thanks. Me, um, Back to you, I Remit could, just means to send, right? Your organization, uh, Overseas yep. knows what it is like is, is implied there. They mean Western so, uh, Union. Or out of the country. You're going to you know, send dollars to other countries, thereby you you know, first, devaluing this economy. Who was involved in, uh, in your working group and why did you... Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we several years ago, um, we had a very positive experience in bringing together financial industry leaders around the fact that the mainstream financial system, the mainstream payment system, credit cards, were being used for the purchase and distribution of child pornography. Uh, I called the chairman of a major credit card company and said, how is this possible? And he said, we don't know what these transactions are for. If you can find for us, show for us uh, where the merchant bank is, where the account res uh, resides. This is an illegal use of the payment system. We can stop the payments. We can shut down the accounts. So we brought together coalitions, America, Europe, and Asia, and had enormous positive impact. Uh, there was a dramatic decline. But as I began to talk to law enforcement and other leaders around the world, what we determined was that we didn't end it. We just moved it. And we were seeing evidence of a migration. There's a lot of typing if you want to mute your mic. Kinds of illegal operations. Oh, I guess not. Don't don't mute. The same model to bring <laughs> leader, private sector leaders together uh, to try to develop shared uh, commons and solutions. That's why we joined with Thompson Ritters uh, to create this this task force, and it includes. Um, the Bitcoin Foundation, it includes the Tor Project, it includes the Gates Foundation, and uh, the uh, Brookings Institution, Cato Institute, um, uh, Vital Voices, a human rights group. It includes multiple law enforcement groups and representatives. The intent was people together better understand the problem and search for common ground. And so that's been our process. At least this second panel, they seem to all have their hearts in the right place. And you've partly answered this question, but I want to ask it uh, anyway. But just share with you uh, us a bit further what you've been able to learn from the, uh, the dialogue that you facilitated, especially as it with the exploitation of children around the world. Uh, I think we've, we've really learned a lot in a short time. One of the challenges is most of the evidence is anecdotal uh, because 
relatively few cases are actually being made, uh, as we've talked to law enforcement. I talked about that earlier in terms of the apps. Yeah, it's not like there was some explosion in uh, child track trafficking. Uh, it really makes no sense why this guy's here. Uh, that there is broad-based interest in searching for and finding reasonable solutions that work. Uh, we have we have learned, I think, as was pointed out earlier, that the digital economy is far broader than Bitcoin. So the issues we're focusing on are not just Bitcoin, but for example, there are 22 million users today of Russia's web money. Uh, we we have talked about Liberty Reserve and the case that was made there, six billion dollars in in Ill illegal money laundering. What's he talking about? Russia's web money. Complex issue. Uh, but I think it's one that is addressable, and I think the most. I believe Russia has a uh, online a currency that's used for many, shopping. Many of the uh, Bitcoin recently and interfaced with it, I believe. Place that one of the biggest challenges for policymakers is simply to increase the level of awareness, so that countries around the world will begin to use the tools they already have. So that in part is the reason we're having this hearing. We're good. Um, We're talking with a um, fellow who goes to the same church as we do back in um, in Delaware. The other day, he's in the auto business, sells uh, a lot of cars. He's, he's dealerships sell a lot of cars in our state. And uh, he's talking about the uh, the work of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, established a couple of years ago, uh, hopefully to, to look out for the uh, the interest of, of consumers uh, throughout this country in a lot of different uh, ways. But I want to. Uh, Talk, uh, focus just a little bit on, on, on consumers, if, if we could. And the uh, uh, huh. I've been told that virtual currencies pose a, a number of questions uh, uh, as to their use by, by consumers. And I have uh, maybe two questions. But the first is, um, maybe you should go down the panel, or go up the panel, Mr. Vita, we'll start with you. And uh, if, uh, if you will, just give us some of your thoughts on whether virtual currencies have sufficient protections built in to them for consumers. The virtual they have sufficient protections built into them for consumers. Issues no, for use your own in head. Buyer beware. To do anything to better protect Because I know that's what I like about all of the currencies of the past is that they had little protection mechanisms built right there into them. Like remember the fingerprint scanners on the gold I coins in Rome. This is very nascent. <laughs> right. Trying to uh, find better in dollars. Mm -hmm. As a result of, of the folks who are at this point uh, participating in this economy, um, uh, really have to try hard to participate in it. So these are not your average consumers just yet um, jumping in uh, to this space. But thanks um, for all the uh, free so publicity. It gives regulators some time to to more about the technology and learn more about what um, uh, the industry players are doing to uh, to address these concerns and whether they. The existing consumer protection laws. Uh, I are don't understand the price price fluctuation between Bitstamp and Mt. Gox. I don't. That's a big difference. It's because in Mt. Gox, um, you're not able. There's a problem with taking out U.S. dollars. On payments. So people buy Bitcoin to take out Bitcoin rather than take out U.S. dollars. I see. They seem to be the wild, wild west of traders. The most crazy traders are at Mt. Gox. Uh, have a, uh, uh, a uh, you know your identity stolen or uh, uh, something that you received is not what you ordered. You can always have a charge reversed. Um, well, I think Mount Gox is also more volatile for that reason that they are reversed. not looking to take out U.S. dollars. This law presents a new choice for the wild trades. They're in it for volatility. More expensive. We're not insured. but less. That's a new choice for consumers that wasn't there before. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lair. I think there's. Many uh, issues uh, around consumer adoption of digital currency. I'll touch on a couple of them. Um, we emphasize that uh, Bitcoin, uh, as a digital currency, offers great potential to lower the fraud risk that both consumers and merchants face on a day-to-day -day basis when we conduct payments. Uh, when, when we go into a restaurant and give our credit card out, or when we enter that information online, we're effectively giving out the keys to our bank account, to every counterparty that we interact with. Here, here. So it should not be a surprise that we've seen dramatic growth 
in the amount of identity theft and specifically uh, financial information, private financial information being stolen and sold on black markets and used for nefarious reasons. Um, protocols like Bitcoin reduce that risk uh, because the keys to your bank account, the keys to your money are never transmitted. Uh, and that's one of the brilliant aspects. Of the and so there's real potential to lower uh, occurrences of financial fraud and consumer transactions and increase consumer privacy as a result. So I think those are really key benefits. Uh, but there are risks, clearly, for consumers. I think one risk, uh, and this is one that we take very seriously as we look at this, is uh, increasingly, uh, because of ease of use, consumers that want to take advantage of things like Bitcoin are, are using online services that essentially host their Bitcoin uh, on servers or on the internet. Uh, and because uh, uh, Bitcoin itself, the, the mechanism by which funds can be used is uh, based on keys that we then in turn would store, uh, there's a real risk around the security of funds. And we've seen uh, occurrences just in the past weeks of uh, startups who did not have appropriate levels of security around those funds where those funds were effectively stolen. And so I think there's really critical requirements around the safeguarding of funds, the custodianship of these keys, uh, and best practices and methods like that. I think industry is driving forward on that, but it's a key issue that the CFPB may take a look at. Uh, I think there's other, the flip side, this question of what I would call merchant fraud, which is the chargeback scenario. You didn't get the product, you got products, someone had uh, inappropriately used your account. Uh, I think that there are methods uh, for addressing that within the technology of Bitcoin today and within improvements that are coming in updated uh, upcoming versions of Bitcoin, mechanisms to create refunds to consumers, uh, mechanisms to provide greater transparency around what you're paying for. Uh, and there are mechanisms even that are not well understood, uh, I think generally, but which will become available, where funds can be held in escrow until a product has been delivered to a consumer. So there are wet ways to address some of that merchant fraud risk as well. And I think you're gonna see industry participants uh, pushing forward on that. Uh, I'm seeing a severe drop in the, the price on Mount Gox, or is that BTC China? This is BTC China, and you can see they're starting to buy back in right here, the green line. I'll reserve my comments strictly to Bitcoin, centralized currencies. Um, and you, when you look at Bitcoin especially, we haven't even released version 0 0.9. Uh, so we're not on version 1.0. Very much still an experimental currency, and it should be considered a high-risk environment for consumers and investors. That's right. At the moment, that's changing over time. If he had said beta, I would have had bingo. Are coming into the space and building the service layers on top of the Bitcoin protocol to make it safer for consumers to move in. Uh, those service layers are both technological. Uh, Bitcoin is written referred to as programmable money, so you can build in layers of escrow and and dispute mediation and things like that right into your payment structure, which is a very interesting uh, concept uh, as most of the laws that exist for consumer protection in the payment space were built around traditional methods where those weren't possible. So potentially you don't need... Oh, so it's like new and improved. ...in the long term to the midterm as this system... Oh, man. I'm not even full screen here. Come on, C-SPAN. ...grows up. In the short term, consumers should be aware that this is a high-risk environment and that potentially it's not quite ready for mass uh, consumer adoption today. That time is coming, but, but it's not here yet. Thank you. Mr. Allen. The other panelists... That was the best here. answer so far. ...much to add, other than to say, uh, we one of the groups we met with on this were central bankers and, and financial industry leaders, and they clearly view, as I think the other panelists do, uh, virtual currencies is akin to cash. So there is no FDIC. Uh, there is no, uh, there is that, not, not that level of, of protection. So I think it has to be viewed as high risk, and I think the points that the other panelists made about The fact that Are they going to get licenses? That's that what I want to know. Are they going to start saying, yeah. okay, we got to issue bit licenses now, and they're going to be global? You just got to let consumers decide their own level of risk tolerance. I mean, like, this is this yeah. caveat emptor at its yeah. most basic. And uh, I'm told that the uh, protocol was developed by either by maybe a, a programmer or by uh, a group of programmers 
They go by the name, I think it's Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> okay. And, uh, that is going to be part of the uh, the auto tune uh, to Bitcoin. It, it just seems strange uh, that this, uh, this individual would, would, uh, would choose to, to remain uh, uh, anonymous. Do uh, what do we know about this person? What do we know? Just about to remain anonymous, this? though. I mean, what do, what do we know about this guy? What do we know about him? This person's anonymous. What do we know about them? Nothing. They're anonymous. How about this person's name is this person is anonymous. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Satoshi Nakamoto is the pseudonym for the creator of creators, he, she, they. Why does he wear the mask? Oh, wait. Uh, the SPAC. For, for the Bitcoin protocol into the world, in addition to the original code base that was then open sourced uh, to the entire community. Uh, this person or group of people has. You know, he's sitting at home watching this, this drinking a beer. Or, um, Can you turn it, him up just a, t a little bit while he explains this? From that original code has already been rewritten. Um, while I think everybody is grateful for that incredible contribution, at this moment in time, uh, who Satoshi is, is largely irrelevant to the story of Bitcoin going forward. And I think that was intentional, and possibly why mm -hmm. it was chosen in the first place. All right, anybody else? <laughs> yeah. I just want to, um, uh, it is a little strange, uh, Bitcoin, we don't know who the creator is. And so um, that often... That guy is Superman. There's some risk here I know it. Have not. You don't think it was Al Gore, do you? Oh, oh an joke. Dude, and people say I should be more serious. Um, but I, I think the key thing to emphasize is that Bitcoin. No, I think Bitcoin was invented by Grover Norquist. <laughs> um, uh, what was the Al Gore joke? I missed it. He says you don't think Al Gore invented it, do you? <laughs> this thing's full of great jokes. This is going to be lots of fun tomorrow. More than half of the code base has been written by us. See, that's what Bitcoin is. It's a series of tubes. <laughs> We're uh, start, start voting uh, over, in the, over in the capital. Thank so, you, Doc. <laughs> um, I think we'll wrap, we'll wrap it up by... Uh, I just want to say, I love to quote Albert Einstein. Not all my colleagues do, but he said, he said some just That's a nice sentiment. Things. One of the things he said, adversity lies opportunity. Think about it. And adversity lies opportunity. God knows there's plenty of adversity uh, with respect to these virtual currencies that we've talked about. It's not just potential. It's not just possible. It's, it's real. And we need, need to be not just mindful of that, but vigilant to make sure that, that we contain it and eliminate it where, where we can. We gotta can it. I really Eliminate it. From, uh, he took that movie. beautiful quote, yeah. turned it on its head, yeah. and. As it relates to my my efforts to try to get my head around. Really the, contrary to the intent of the quote. In Bitcoin, Mrs. Einstein, who probably was quite brilliant in her own right. When your only tool is a hammer, Michelle. Which, uh, asked yeah. uh, if she understood her husband's theory of relativity, and she allegedly responded, "I I understand the words, but not the sentences." About that. I understand the words. Oh, the sad, I, I sad, sad. Trying to, 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 to understand what this was all about. I, I, I sort of felt like Mrs. Einstein. And said, I understand the words, but not the sentences. Resign. They kept it so simple for you, dude. Uh, all of you on the second panel. And with the help of uh, my staff. And, <laughs> and the book had no pictures. Brief as I'm starting to understand more than just the words. <laughs> And that's uh, really why we wanted to hold this hearing to, uh, today. To yeah, we're going to need to have a second panel. Hear, uh, the, uh, the this is a good first that, panel. Uh, come from this technology. They already explained everything to them. What could they possibly have in the second panel? Consumers into to, um, to businesses. You know what I think would be great is I, uh, to write to this man, Senator Tom Carper, and suggest that he interview instead for his panel uh, Bitcoin meetup organizers and Bitcoin startup yeah. people who are actually using it. Yeah, I think he should interview the Bitcoin group. We should have he should interview the Bitcoin group. We should invite him on the show. Someday they'll thank me for you. I hope, but. Um, 
is that we have the, I agree uh, with that. The responsibility here in trying to figure out how to make this work so that we uh, uh, manage the bad that can flow from it and maximize the uh, maximize the. It sounds uh, like the, okay, like. Is it just me, or is it the speakers on the computer or something? But it sounds like his his voice has been run through gravel. He sounds. It sounds like Vogon poetry. That's what it sounds like. December third at five p.m. He sounds beaten up and tired. I mean, he started his meeting at three p.m. It's five thirty. You see that? <laughs> see that worn out? So Again, tough listening to these. Like people. he said, you know, he uh, he he understands the words, but not the sentences. His brain is fried. And uh, for you and this panel for joining. Which I mean, so let's you know, let's okay. So so great. So applaud him for having the conversation. Great. I do. And then yes. Also, you know, for someone who's been in a box where the narrative has been, you know, it's waking up is painful. Waking and, and so we have to be merciful, you know. I mean, whether it's a butterfly emerging from a cocoon or waking up from a coma, it is really, really painful. And it's fine for us to laugh at them and go, ha ha, but, you know, um, I think it's an opportunity if, that if we show compassion and that we'll have a better chance of uh, winning people over. What price did we end on, Thomas? We're at uh, eight. Well, in BTC China, we're at eight hundred and forty-two dollars. Mount Gox, seven hundred and thirteen dollars. So that would be up. I'm going with the six seventeen Bitstamp. I like Bitstamp. Yeah, I'm gonna take Bitstamp a little. That's that's what I've been following for the last little while. But you make a great point, Thomas. It looks like China's the one doing most of the driving of the prices upward. And um, that's going to have an effect on Bitstamp and the other exchanges eventually. It's an impressive and interesting range to see them at 600, 700, 800. That's an incredible amount of disparity. But if we take it back, let's think more about 60, 70, and 80. They're, they're not that far apart. Um, but, I mean, I don't know if you heard the question that I posed to Derek and Davi um, answered a little bit, and that is that, I know different exchanges have their fees incorporated into the price, whereas some others don't. Is that could that potentially be what is making the price in BTC China as high as it is because of the, because they're limited or not in the exchange they're able to use? I doubt it would account for a price disparity in the hundreds. Well, BTC China also has the benefit of not having any fees right now. So if you were looking to use oh, an exchange in China, anything. there are no fees until, I believe it's till the end of the Chinese national holiday, which I'm not very familiar with, but it's currently fee-less. So, uh, as so for the other ones, I mean, obviously Mt. Gox has the problem where you can't get your dollars out. I think that's created a unique trading environment of pro-Bitcoin people pushing the price up. Bitstamp, I don't know very much about. BTCE has that troll box, which is, I think, a very strange feature where uh, wrong ideas get promoted uh, so that people can buy or sell based upon the wrong ideas. Uh, it, it's a very strange exchange. Hmm. But it if does dollars seem to can't be, be the one that has the highest volume, at least today. I see the volume is at 43% coming from BTCE. If dollars can't be taken out, in what sense is it being traded for dollars? They they have a, a holding account where you could hold your money instead of like selling back to your bank account where it would be USD on Mt. Gox, but then it's trapped there. So if you thought Bitcoin was going to crash, you'd put your money into your holding account, you'd wait for it to crash, and you'd buy back in. But then when you it try to transfer like your money regular. out, you pay more. So those dollars are just trapped in the Mt. Gox system. They're not like they're not some. So well, then that it, might no, that no, might no 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 no. It's acting acting like a regular brokerage account. So basically, you're sitting flat on that or neutral. So whereas like if you use Coinbase and you go from your blockchain info wallet to Coinbase, Coinbase to your bank account, you're not having to use that Coinbase part, so you can actually take your position off and be flat or neutral, and so then you it saves you that step, and if there's a round trip uh, fee on the you know transfer from there to Coinbase and back, 
then you're not having to pay that. So it is like if I were trading full time and there and there was enough volume here that I was trading interactive d throughout the day, I would definitely use Mt. Gox according to what you just said. And many people do. The biggest thing for m me today is that th the government, the federal government thought that it was a good idea to have this meeting. But of course, there is no federal government, can't do any thinking. But the individuals who um, <laughs> inhabit those, those buildings, um, they thought it was important enough to spend the time uh, putting people in front of cameras and grilling them with relatively softball questions about Bitcoin. I think it's just the beginning of many hearings on the topic and I thank you all so much for uh, being willing to to join in this commentary this first ever commentary I thought, thought it was amazing it went great we've I got a like you all you all look so handsome you're so dressy I'm in my post sweat like nasty but I was so excited to see y'all and to be part of this so thanks for including me I'm glad you came on. Uh, I've I've got my shiny badges pin on. <laughs> yeah. Nice. But, but you can get your own at shinybadges.com. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to thank everyone. Looks like we'll be uh, editing these videos together to make one solid compilation and and um, take out any mistakes. So hopefully <laughs> we'll have a, a good clean video that will be age appropriate for all audiences. <laughs> Derek, do you want us to stay on the air here? Are you ready to sign off here? I'm going to sign off. I thank you all for, for joining. Right. I think this was a huge success. All right. I'll talk Cheers. to you post-Bitcoin uh, meeting tomorrow night. Okay, great. Cheers. <laughs>